Good afternoon. We'd like to welcome you all to our ongoing series of Medicine and Society. And we have a special treat in a little different format today. As you know, we usually have three speakers on one topic. Well, today we have one speaker who wears many different hats to discuss a very specific topic. We're very pleased to have Dr. Stephen Miles here with us from Minneapolis. Uh, Dr. Miles is a, an internist, a geriatrician, ethicist, and a true scholar. I first met him through the literature uh, and reading some of his work, and then I was very fortunate when I was doing my fellowship at the University of Chicago that he was one of the faculty who uh, taught me ethics at the University of Chicago. Since that time, he has moved on to Minneapolis, where he is associate professor in medicine and geriatrics uh, at the University of Minnesota and is clinical ethicist at Hennepin County Medical Center. And um, I wanted him to come and, and address us. And there were several topics that I would have, uh, that I would like to hear him address, but the one that uh, I chose was his involvement and perceptions and the implications of the Helga Wangley case. This case happened in Hennepin County Medical Center. Dr. Miles was intimately involved in it, and he gave me a couple options. He said, I can talk to you about the, um, uh, the case and the relationships of people and, and how, it, how it played out, what was not in the press, which would be interesting. He said, or I can talk about it uh, in a more theoretical uh, sense and talk about futility. I chose the latter, uh, but the good news is that the former will be published in the uh, Kennedy Institute proceedings uh, within a couple of months, and you can look that up because uh, I got a glance at the galleys, and that's really fascinating relationships. But we are very pleased to have Dr. Miles speak to us about um, the Helga Wangley case and futility, and uh, we will leave a few minutes at the end for your questions and discussion. Dr. Miles. Thanks, Bob. What I'd like to do today um, is try and do a twofer. Uh, I'm going to run through the, the Wangley case itself fairly quickly, but then move on to a fairly detailed discussion of the current debate about medical futility. Mrs. Wangley was an 87 year old woman who was living at home in December of uh, 1990 when she uh, fell and broke her hip and uh, wound up going to a nursing home. I'm sorry, uh, 1989. Uh, was admitted uh, to our facility from the nursing home on January 1st, 1990 with extreme shortness of breath, which was uh, determined to be due to uh, end stage uh, chronic lung disease uh, and bronchiectasis. She was immediately intubated on admission to our facility, which had not cared for her previously. And we spent the next uh, four and a half months uh, from January through April uh, trying to uh, wean this woman off of ventilator. We were not able to do so. She had repeated current uh, respiratory infections. During this time, uh, numerous efforts were made to communicate with her and to try and understand her preferences and how she was seeing the treatment. She was intermittently delirious uh, or obtunded throughout the entire hospitalization. And uh, there were times where she would uh, try and appear to disconnect the ventilator. There were other times when she was asked if she wanted to have it removed, she would say no. Uh, there were other times when she just simply was uh, non-communicative at all. She did appear to recognize uh, her family um, but she could not communicate by writing uh, or in any other way. In May, she was transferred to a chronic care hospital on the ventilator for continued efforts at weaning. At that time, she was uh, going on and off the machine for various intervals, a um, couple hours at a time. And uh, uh, about two weeks after discharge from our hospital, she suffered a cardiac arrest during one of the periods off the machine. She was transferred to an acute care hospital where it was determined um, that she had suffered a major uh, anoxic injury to the brain, maintained on pressors for a couple days, and as uh, she failed to waken, uh, the hospital raised the possibility that maybe aggressive life support for this previously established permanently respirator dependent patient who was now unconscious at 87 years old might not be appropriate, and the family asked that she be transferred back to our hospital, where we were happy to accept her. So she came back into our hospital in June, having completed a four and a half month hospitalization earlier in the year. 
we spent about two weeks evaluating her and concluded that this woman was, um, uh, had suffered indeed a profound anoxic uh, um, cortical damage and suggested uh, the possibility uh, that uh, treatment might be um, discontinued or abated. And there were a series of discussions that were conducted by attendings, not house staff, with the uh, family, in which the family said that it could never be in Mrs. Wangley's interest uh, to be uh, dead rather than alive, and that furthermore, the very proposal that a respirator might be stopped or that treatment might be limited in any way for this woman uh, would indeed signal the end of Western civilization and the return of barbarism. Uh, a DNR order was, uh, was, however, agreed to with the understanding of full aggressive treatment uh, in the meantime. The residents rotated off, the attendings rotated off, and in August, a new phase of the case uh, opened up. More or less with the physicians charting continuously, we do not see this intensive care being a benefit to this lady. Uh, trying to maintain open relationships with the family, uh, the dialogue, however, uh, uh, really uh, ended with the family saying they did not want to discuss treatment planning for this woman again. In August, a nurse had a dream, and the dream was that the nurse came into the room and Mrs. Wangley was sitting up in bed and asked the nurse, why are you doing this to me? When the nurse told this dream to, her, um, to the other uh, nursing colleagues, it crystallized a sentiment which had been in the nursing uh, station for some time, that this type of endless treatment plan which would surely result in a death on life support for this profoundly damaged woman um, was simply not making sense and was something that we couldn't ask our nurses. Short, while I was working with the nurses to try and see if we could dream up some way to help them come to terms with the treatment plan, a new attending came on who was a devout uh, pro-life Catholic and he uh, struggled with her care for some time and finally came to me and said, you know, this doesn't seem like what medicine is all about. Has the Catholic Church said anything on this situation? So I gave him a copy of, of uh, relevant Catholic documents on this, including the uh, encyclical on human life and uh, Pope's address to the uh, Council of Anesthesiologists. And he finally came to me and he said, you know, this isn't what medicine is for. We are not relieving her suffering because she's not capable of feeling any suffering. We cannot get her off the ventilator or the uh, continuous IV antibiotics or the air flotation bed or the continuous hyper or, uh, uh, enteral hyperalimentation uh, or the continuous biochemical monitoring for her uh, chronic renal failure and her aortic insufficiency. And furthermore, Although I'm very happy to supply continuous respirator therapy for people who are chronically lung disabled, this person cannot enjoy the quality of life that comes from being chronically lung disabled because she is permanently unconscious. And therefore, I can't do with this respirator everything that a respirator was designed to do. And to make a long story short, we told the family that we were unwilling to continue to prescribe the respirator and offered them the option of transferring the patient, which they refused, offered them the option of having them go to court to obtain a court order mandating our treatment, which uh, we said we would be, then be happy to provide, which they refused, and asked, finally saying that we would go to court to, to determine whether or not we were obliged to provide care that we did not feel could serve the patient's interests. And after a long uh, court uh, uh, pretrial pre process, um, there was an inconclusive legal ruling uh, which did not answer the question, and Mrs. Wangley uh, died soon after that. Let me propose that this case can be fit within the general framework of medical futility. And let me propose a definition of medical futility that is something as follows. Medical futility refers to a physician's conclusion that therapy will not be of value or cannot benefit a patient and should not be provided. This is an enormous debate 
around 15 major reviews and over 50 articles in the last four years. It is a debate which has implications both for the doctor-patient relationship, it is a debate which has major implications for the allocation of health care resources. Indeed, the question as to whether there is such a thing as medical futility is a debate which, upon which the very possibility of an equitable health care system itself might rest. Let me try and take this debate down for you so you can see what's in it. There are currently four clinical uses of futility which have been, are being widely discussed. Uh, first, there are therapies which are physiologically implausible, therapies which are non-beneficial, therapies which are unlikely to work, and therapies which are non-validated. For example, there are therapies which are physiologically implausible. Physicians might say that it is futile to use interferon to clear, cure stomach cancer. Here, the end of therapy and the means are assessed against goals which the patient and the physician both agree on. Secondly, there may be therapies which have a physiologic effect, but which are non-beneficial to the patient as a person. For example, in the Finelli case in Boston, a patient underwent a heart transplant and suffered profound anoxic encephalopathy and was receiving immune suppressive medications to the tune of around $75,000 a year. And the doctors argued that we should stop the immune suppressive medications because they could not benefit this patient. Uh, likewise, um, there are also uh, therapies somewhat related to this. That was the Finelli case. There are therapies which cause vast and disproportionate harms. For example, baby Rena was a child dying of uh, life support or dying of AIDS on advanced life support in constant pain um, in uh, Washington, where the physicians went to court to stop aggressive care for this baby who had been abandoned by her mother. The physicians lost in the Rena, baby Rena case, the uh, Finale case, which is actually very similar to the Wangley case, the physicians won, although it went, it's currently on appeal. A third, there are therapies which are very unlikely to produce an effect. Uh, for example, um, uh, antibiotics for a cold, CT scans to evaluate tension headaches, but probably the uh, paradigm of this debate right now is the debate over the use of CPR for chronically ill elderly patients where the survival from CPR can be reliably pre be predicted uh, at less than 2 percent. However, it's very difficult to prove that a therapy won't have an effect and so people are using confidence intervals of 0 to 2, 0 to 5 percent and saying that at some point though we can't prove it won't work, it becomes so improbable that it would work that we could call this a futile effort. Fourth, there are non-validated but, uh, but plausible therapies. For example, recently in New York, an insurer refused to pay for a bone marrow transplant to treat Mrs. Harper's breast cancer. Mrs. Harper's breast cancer had metastasized to her bones, to her eyes, and to her liver. And the use of bone marrow transplant had never been validated for this use. Uh, and indeed, there was uh, very little evidence that would work, although her physician said that it might give her a 20 percent chance of years of cancer-free survival. Well, there was no empiric foundation for that claim. And what the insurer said is, well, be that as it may, this is not yet validated, and so we will not provide it. It's futile. Now, these four types of futility are really not mutually exclusive. For example, uh, the idea of using a baboon heart to save a dying baby for a later cure before the advent of modern immune therapy could be considered implausible, unlikely to work, non-beneficial, and non-validated. Uh, ditto uh, the use of, uh, say, um, as you have out here in California, uh, lopping off the heads of the nearly dead or the, uh, or the recently dead and dipping them in a freezer to wake them up at some day when head reattachment is available could probably meet all the, all the different kinds of futility simultaneously, kind of a futility royal flush. 
Um, I think, though, that the debate here has to ask a more profound question than just the different kind of clinical uses of futility, but has to ask the, more, the deeper question of what exactly is futility itself? What, what, what kind of concept is it? And I can think of three major possibilities. One is that it's a logical, it's a, it's a form of a logical argument. Uh, the second possibility is it's a form of a professional duty. And the third is that it's an institution for making uh, tragic choices. Now, the way the professional ethicists and philosophers tend to use this is futility as a logical argument. And it, it actually consists of two arguments. One is a defining argument. Uh, Non-Y therapies are futile. X is a non-Y therapy. X is futile. And then a duty argument that goes something like this. There's no duty to offer futile therapies. X is a futile therapy. There's no duty to offer X. And so you wind up with something like this. Um, now there's, as you take this apart, you actually come up with, with in uh, Perlman and Johnson's work, uh, the concept that there are actually two different types of logical futility. There's so-called quantitative futility. That is, where the debate about, about the operativeness of it depends on how likely it is. And then there's qualitative futility. Yes, this therapy will work, but it's not a benefit. It is not benefiting Mrs. Wangley to provide a respirator for a woman who is, who is uh, life support, utterly life support dependent and, um, and uh, unconscious. Now, uh, in the quantitative futility, then, uh, there's a big uh, debate that refers to what level of quantitative certainty do we need. Uh, for example, how do we distinguish, how do we distinguish uh, a low outcome which a patient might properly decide, that is, a patient might want a 10% chance, from an outcome that is so poor uh, that it reaches into the range of physician discretion of not to offer it. And this whole business of distinguishing futile outcomes from unlikely outcomes uh, is um, a fundamental problem for moral theory, but it also is a fundamental problem for, for most outcome research because most research showing low outcomes does not give the, quality or the um, confidence interval of a low outcome range. Uh, Lantos's paper, for example, on very low birth weight babies did. It calculated that even though there were zero survivors in this group, the range of possible survivorship was zero to eight percent. The distinction between low outcome and non-outcome is a social agreement. It's a value judgment. It is not a scientific finding. Now, similarly, qualitative um, futility has been also critiqued. Uh, and here are the contenders for no benefit therapy. One, uh, per permanent loss of consciousness. Uh, second, uh, permanent holistic dependence on life support. For example, I'm sure you all recall that kid who was raised uh, in a bubble in Texas for, uh, with a congenital immune disorder. And the kid was raised to about age 14, and then he said, uh, look, this is not worth it anymore. And he walked out of the bubble and died. And uh, even though it would technically be possible to duplicate that experience again, no center in the world is going to embark on that for, for, um, for this kind of a kid. And so this concept of permanent holistic dependence on life support, where the only way survival can happen is by, is by the thorough and total medicalization of a life, uh, may be a contender for qualitative futility. Then there's both of the above, and I think Mrs. Wangley is a good example of that, an uh, unconscious 87-year-old woman who has to stay in an ICU and is unconscious. Uh, and then the whole concept of, of, um, of uh, imminent death, uh, a therapy um, that has an effect which would delay death by an hour or two or a day or two, uh, or in the case of the CPR d debate, not prolong life beyond hospital discharge, uh, has been an area uh, where qualitative futility has come up. The problem is, who gets to decide that these are unacceptable ends? In the case of in the case of Mrs. Wangley, the husband said, well, you can say that, that permanent holistic dependence on life support is not something that uh, you uh, uh, consider a valid medical end, but uh, that's my choice, or that's my wife's choice, and uh, we get to decide. Is the end point for qualitative futility chosen by personal choice, or can physicians pick, does clinical judgment define a set of valid endpoints for medical therapy? Or is it a social consensus? Now, the very fact of this debate 
the very fact that the selection of an end for qualitative futility uh, is up for debate uh, says to many people that there's no such thing as medical futility. Can't have it. You know, it's just your, your, as Mr. Wangley said, well, that's just your opinion. And I think that um, that's, there's a lot to that, actually. Um, I think what it really says is that, one of the things it says is that futility can't be a logical ideal. It has to be probabilistic, as in the debate about uh, qualitative uh, or quantitative futility. But it seems to me that if we say that, that the endpoint has to be entirely chosen by some sort of personal evaluation of the phenomenon, like by personal choice, we basically do away with futility and collapse that whole ethic into um, the concept of uh, patient autonomy. I don't think that's a good idea, although we can talk about that. Now, if you, futility isn't a logical argument, it may be that it's some sort of professional responsibility. And here's how this argument goes. Futility is a professional obligation which is grounded on, a prognost on the physician's prognostic expertise and duty to benefit a patient and to not inflict pain. And what this does is it says that a, when a patient, uh, when a physician concludes that a therapy is futile by whatever professional criteria the profession is empowered to use, then they can limit patient choices by not offering not providing or by refusing to provide a requested therapy. Uh, Blackhall kind of kicked this off, uh, the recent debate on this, by an argument that a woman who was dying of cancer or uh, leukemia, there was no duty to even tell her about the possibility of CPR. The doc should just ensure that it's not done. Now, there's been an enormous critique of Blackhall on the, on the idea that we could not disclose that somebody had a futile condition. But there is an enormously long traditional and modern view that physicians should not provide therapies which cannot uh, provide or pr uh, lead a, take a patient to health. Uh, Hippocrates, for example, in the epidemics argued that physicians should not treat those who are overmastered by their disease. And um, indeed, uh, that type of argument grounds the definition of futility in the norms of practice. Uh, as, for example, the new VA policy just defines futility as anything that's outside of standard care, something that seems rather um, a rather uh, uh, a loose definition of futility, at least to my view. But I, don't, I do think that it points out that when we think about futility as a clinical practice ideal, we wind up with with highlighting the fact that if it is if there is such a thing as medical futility, it's a professional judgment. It's a professional conclusion, it's not a personal conclusion. That is, if I say to Mr. Wangley, we do not do this here, I am speaking on behalf of the profession rather than my own personal view that respirators shouldn't be provided to unconscious 87-year-olds who are permanently lung dependent, or respirator dependent. And to the, so that in this sense, the physician's objection to providing futile therapy is somewhat different say, to um, the physician's objection um, to uh, therapies which may reflect only the physician's personal views. I think we've kind of reached that stage in the abortion debate where we'll say we're going to have cultural pluralism on the part of the medical profession and society. Physicians who don't want to do abortions shouldn't have to do them, but they don't really, can't really say it's entirely outside of the practice of medicine. I recognize that's an enormous debate, but in the Wangley case, I think it's instructive to note that both before and after this case became a matter of public controversy, while we had top dollar insurance coverage that was uncapped for her whole care, we made efforts to try and transfer this woman to other providers, and every provider in the Minneapolis-St. Paul metropolitan area who had a chance to look at this case said, no, we don't do this. Well, she's not rehabable, one hospital said. We just don't do this. And so, in fact, there was a dissent on the part of not only all the physicians in our hospital about her care, but there was a dissent about the community itself saying, this is just not what these tools are for. Now, the problem with this definition is, the problem with this definition is it's, it tends to be somewhat uh, depersonalizing. For example, it doesn't really say that the patient's preference gets drowned out by a stronger autonomy one. It says, I'm sorry, but there's nothing more we can do. But the real problem with this is the problem that 
I think tripped up the pa the paper early paper on futility by Lantos and all. Um, a paper where I think I was like about twelfth author on a list of sixteen. Um, and what they said was, we don't see any compelling reason to disempower a patient. Sure, we could refuse, but uh, after all, um, Mrs. Wangley's unconscious. She can't feel what we're doing is hurting her. Um, and uh, Blackhall's re reluctance to perform uh, painful CPR on a dying leukemia patient uh, mainly hurts the patient, not, not Blackhall, so uh, back off. Um, let the patients decide. Uh, and that furthermore, as several people argued in commenting on Wangley, they said uh, the very proposal that a doctor would say no to a requested therapy is traumatic of the doctor-patient relationship. Now, I think that we have to look at that very carefully because, in fact, it, what it, one of the things that that does is it presumes that the patient before you has unlimited access to health care. That is, it presumes that the presence of Blackhall's Black leukemic patient, it presumes that the presence of Mrs. Wangley has access to care. And I think that's an elite presumption. Because if we want to really say that, the, that Mrs. Wangley or uh, the Blackhall patient has a compelling autonomy interest that's grounded in life, and that therefore it should be honored regardless of medical judgment, it seems to me that the very ground of saying that, this is a compelling interest because it's a life interest, should be made universally available. That is, we should be willing to say we're going to honor this preference for all comers. Now, as a matter of fact, we don't have that kind of a health care system. And so what it seems to me we're talking about here is we're not talking so much about autonomy as we're talking about a privileged consumer. It's an elite notion of autonomy. It's a notion of autonomy that essentially looks like the autonomy of the buyer at Rodeo Drive. Because we are not willing to extend this notion of autonomy universally. We are not willing to say that this life interest, as supreme as it is, is a supreme life interest for all players. We're only willing to say this is a supreme life interest for people whose access is guaranteed. And this takes us, I think, to a more sophisticated understanding of what futility might be. Futility could well be an institution. Now, an institution is a kind of a complex term. I hate to drag sociology into medical ethics, but you got to take it where it goes. Um, an institution is a pattern of ethical and expected behavior by individuals and groups, which is supported by laws and mores. For example, if I walk down the hall, an institution can be real simple. If I hold out my hand and you don't shake it, we have communicated you in a rather hostile manner. An institution, however, can also be much, much more complex than that. Uh, the notion, for example, of, um, of uh, why um, artificial hearts are on the American healthcare development agenda and why mud baths are a basic health care that is covered in all German health care policies. Okay? That an institution, a pattern of ethical and expected behavior, is fairly complex and it's also fairly much culturally bound. In fact, institutions, these patterns of normative behavior, can only be understood within their specific cultural context. Now, if it's this is a real helpful thing because institutions are necessarily phenomenological. You get past the ethicists who say, well, unless you can prove this therapy won't work, then it can't fit, fit work in this uh, syllogism. But it also suggests to the ethicists, I think, that you can't dream up hypothetical futilities. You have to speak of futility in our healthcare system. And a good example, I think, of hypothetical futility is the argument goes, that goes like this. Well, gee whiz, if there were infinite personal resources, this therapy wouldn't be futile. You'd just do it. Well, I think that's kind of an interesting argument. Um, but the fact is that our health care system does pool and redistribute enormous resources. And so whatever that concept is, I think we should be careful about generalizing that to our health care system. Now, the counterclaim to that is that that addition of the resource claim simply confuses futility. And let me go on to deal with that in some detail. The best book on futility that's ever written is Calabrese's book, Tragic Choices. 
Futility, I think, operates at a precisely the moment of a tragic choice. It is the decision that life support should not be used to try and prolong a precious life. And we have very complex ways of making tragic choices. And what Calabrese describes tragic choices, which he describes everything from circumscri uh, circumscription, uh, that is, who do you draft who, when you know that soldiers will die, to the question of how do juries make decisions to impose uh, the death penalty, to decisions about how we allocate health care resources, is, as he says, a tragic choice in his usage is a set of policies, an institution, and a rationale for allocating final, finite resources while preserving endangered values. And he points out in a rather technical discussion that there are a couple components to tragic choices. One is you usually have first order allocation. That is, you say, gee, we have all the health care resources we need in the United States, which is, I think is a fair statement. Our global allocation for health care is adequate. And then you have second order choices, which are where the rubber meets the, mo meets the road, where individual clinicians operate, where we distribute health care to individual need. Okay? And one of the things that we do about second order choices is that we necessarily dis decentralize them. And the reason we decentralize them is we can't, as a society, stand to have an explicit policy that devalues life. And every country which has tried to make specific health care allocation choices, yes and no, at a first order level, has failed, according to Calabrese. They've failed because we need clinical judgment. We need the profession to assume responsibility as a way to handle both the reality of the need for these choices and the fact that we need to rationale, we need a storyline for making them, we need an understanding which allows us to operate in a world where people die despite receiving heroic amounts of medical care. And he says the third criteria of tragic choices is that when you look at them carefully, there's always some ideal somewhere that gives, some ideal that's deformed. Now, as a clinical judgment then, futility winds up being decentralized. It relieves policymakers from the responsibility for explicitly denying life-sustaining treatment. Remember Dan Callahan's first book, uh, Setting Limits? Remember what happened when he said, gee whiz, I propose no, life, no ICUs for 85-year-olds. People went nuts. People went nuts. Okay, we'll make it 95-year-olds or make it 100 years old. Sooner or later, you wind up with saying, we can't have a policy like that. What about the 100-year-old who all they need is a day on a respirator? Callahan, what Callahan misses in that book is Calabrese's point that you need second-order choices, second-order mechanisms. Now, I think that this book defines why there's recent interest in medical futility precisely at the same time when the United States begins to decide begins to accept the duty to provide universal health care. We can't afford to meet every personal claim for health. We need institutions that are empowered to make second order tragic choices. And futility does that in spades because what futility does is it construes those choices as biomedically realistic and it says acting on them is socially responsible. First it's realistic then it's socially responsible. This is different from rationing at the bedside. This is different from saying, I'm going to withhold care from you because you aren't worth it. It's saying, this is realistic, and I must act on this realistic conclusion because it's responsible to do so. And in the Wangley case, we argued, we said we're willing to go to court to say they can evaluate whether or not this therapy is serving her interest, but because we conclude that it doesn't, we have to ask the question of whether the rest of society thinks it is in her interest as stewards of these resources. Because if we don't act, then we have the, 85, the rule for 85-year-olds or we have some other mechanism that is explicit, brutal, and entirely separated from the bedside and which injures many players at the same time at the same time 
that it makes the society even more sadistically cruel than it is. And so futility allows the doctor to be patient-centered, technically proficient, fully equipped to save life, and then requires the doctor to be socially responsible only after the duty to the patient in terms of diagnostic efforts and therapeutics efforts has been fully discharged. This is not bedside rationing. The problem is that it does conflict with American ideals regarding individualism. Because the claim is going to come up that when you withhold futile care, that you devalue either life or you're devaluing autonomy. As Mr. Wangley said, and it drove me nuts for the first six months, he said, I'm not going to let you doc snuff out my wife. OK. Um, you want to talk about it? Um, and so that the futility, to, to empower medical futility, implies a deforming of the ideal of life and autonomy, which will be raised any time the claim is exercised. Can we reconcile this concept, however, with existing understandings of informed consent? I think we can. You know, informed consent was constructed as a right to refuse a medically recommended therapy. It was not constructed as a right to health care. And so a, doc, a patient has to understand the therapy and can say no, or can choose among equivalent therapies. But we have not used informed consent in this country to construct a right to health care and certainly not to construct a right to demand futile care. And indeed, the proposal that informed consent requires us to honor the Wangley claim suggests an incredible set of paradoxes. But one of the things it suggests is that any indigent patient should be able to walk up to our health care system and say, I give my informed consent to receive antibiotics for my pneumonia, and you could no longer turn them away which actually, I'd be willing to junk futility for that kind of health care system. The problem is that if we accept that futility, that people can demand medically futile therapies, what we do is we wind up constructing a right to health care that is not only elite, but is entirely upside down. It says that the right to health care begins with a respirator for the 87-year-old who's unconscious and somehow ends along about the time when people require prenatal care, uh, antibiotics for their pneumonia, and so forth. It's a totally bizarre construction of the right to health care, a right to health care that simply does not make either health care sense, uh, nor does it really make sense in terms of, in terms of the types of individual claims we want to support. A good example of this debate, I think, is a rather incredible development in, um, in New Jersey. Now, New Jersey defines brain death in its statutes. Uh, now, technically, what that is is a first-order policy defining when you can turn people off. New Jersey should never have defined brain death in its statutes. But because the application of that to the Orthodox Jewish community was seen as morally unacceptable, New Jersey then went and defined a conscience clause objection to brain death statutes for people with a religious objections to brain death, thereby unzipping, I think, the whole concept of brain death because the proposal then goes to patients or to families. Well, he's brain dead, except, excuse me, what's your religion? <laughs> nope, not brain dead. Well, it makes no sense to do that. That's why you need a second order chooser, a second order mechanism for making these type of tragic choices. How could we empower futility? It can be done through statutes. For example, most statutes require docs to dispense appropriate care. Minnesota's Bill of Rights uh, says that patients only have a right uh, to appropriate medical care, uh, further constrained by their ability to pay. It could be done through the courts. Um, and uh, we've now had a dozen uh, decisions, um, and I think that the court ruling in the Wangley case and the Finelli case and the Baby Rena case and this other case down in Florida that I can never remember, I think that if you look at them, they really suggest we're thrashing around for a legal way of framing this question. Or it could be done through medical treatises, which may be the appropriate place to define futility, uh, given 
it's a second order choice. And if you look, if you look at the medical uh, treatises, they're pretty interesting. The AMA now says it is ethically prohibited to provide treatment that does not cure or prevent illness or suffering. Uh, who knows what that means exactly. Um, the Society for Critical Care Medicine, uh, December or in 1991, said PVS patients should be taken out of the ICU. Uh, there's no obligation to provide treatment if it's burdensome with no chance of benefit, or according to practice norms, causes loss of function, mutilation, or pain disproportion to benefit. And then it says if you got something where you're unsure, you can provide therapy for a while and then and then act on it. And it says courts are the last resort. Well, that's a pretty interesting set of statements. The most, the most explicit statement of futility has been the American Thoracic Society in September of uh, this year, uh, American Review of Respiratory Diseases. Uh, and they define futility as highly unlikely to result in meaningful survival, such as the PVS patient. They say it includes no, that when that condition is present, there's no ethical obligation to provide it. They say that unlike Black Hall, who would withhold the, the information about the CPR from the leukemic patient, there should be a full disclosure of intention and rationale, a review by the Ethics Committee and judicial review as needed. They note, however, they don't understand yet whether it's, you're legally obliged to continue or not. And frankly, um, after Wangley, I'm not sure either, although we thought about but did not ever ever propose to the family or consider seriously stopping and seeing if we could be prosecuted. I don't frankly think we can, but I don't think that I've got enough guts to try. I think that if there is such a thing as me medical futility, which we need, it'll rest on clinical judgment, an open decision-making process, one that is rigorously accountable. Our, our process consisted of holding ourselves accountable to the board of directors of the hospital, which happened to be the county board of commissioners, and to the courts. Um, I think that we will have to acknowledge how sad some of these, these decisions are. And I think we'll also have to not, no longer give weight to the elite presumption of access and the presumption that we never think about resources at the bedside unless we're willing to live on that and open the front door of our hospital to all comers. I think there is an ethic of stewardship. I think it would be a tragic mistake to reject futility. Some physicians will give life-saving baboon heart transplants to dying babies. Some families will insist on prolonged life support for brain-dead persons or permanently unconscious people. Sub such dissents do explo expose the tragic choice. Sometimes you can make an informal accommodation, support for a while. We could completely debunk futility by saying, well, you never know for sure, or this is just your opinion. But I don't think we would be served by, well served by doing so, because I think that medical futility offers us a psychically tolerable way of speaking about the most difficult end-of-life decisions. It provides a framework within which the value of life the inevitability of death, professional responsibility, remorse, and social justice can all be reconciled. If we demolish futility in the name of truth, it would be replaced by explicit politically imposed decisions about which lives were not worth living. Without futility, medically supported life would just be a commodity whose span was meted by dollars. Thank you. Yeah, sure. We're open to questions from the uh, audience. Yeah. I had a question about the uh, competency of surrogates. Yeah. Have there been any attempts to try to declare the surrogate incompetent? Yeah, I, I think it's a bad approach. I yeah, the uh, most famous one was the uh, baby Jackson or baby Jane Doe in uh, Atlanta this year. This is a child who was dying, feeling enormous pain from aggressive life support, and the physicians tried to declare the parents to be child, that tried to declare this as a form of child abuse and terminate parental rights so they could stop treatment. 
very bad. Took the court about a half an hour to kick that one out. I think it would be very difficult to prove Mr. Wangley to be incompetent. And what I said every time I was asked was, I don't think he's mis incompetent. I think he's just mistaken. Um, and this thoroughly confused people because we're not supposed to, I mean, how do you know? I haven't seen the final score sheet. But um, I think that competence is going to have a very limited use here because Mr. Wangley clearly was an intelligent, functioning man out in the community. He was a lawyer. And um, he met no definition of uh, legal incompetence that I'm aware of. Um, I think we, we're going to have to, unfortunately, join the, the basic question. Yep. Why then was the case framed in terms of obtaining uh, a conservatorship? The case was framed in terms of generating conservatorship for the following reasons. If you look at the right to die cases, most time what you see in them is you see the appointment of a guardian ad litem who makes a finding to the court as to whether the therapy was meeting the patient's interests. And then the court takes the guardian ad litem's decision and the family's position, the doc's position, and comes to a decision as to what to do. Minnesota does not have a guardian ad litem law, and so our agreement with the judge was a two-step procedure by which a guardian would be appointed to make a finding as to whether the therapy was in the patient's interest. And then it was our, uh, the agreement was that we would, if that was appointed, that we would then go to court to evaluate whether given that finding, assuming it said the therapy wasn't in her interest, we were obliged to provide it. It served a way of, of doing two things, both emphasizing our accountability to an independent judgment that this therapy couldn't help this woman, but also it protected uh, us and the legal system from a bad precedent saying docs had to provide bad therapies. Because in the event we failed to get the guardian ad litem, which we did, the court specifically said, we're not answering the question of whether or not you're obliged to provide it. If you want to come back and ask us whether you have to provide it, given that the husband is, is demanding it, come on back and ask us that question. Yes? Uh, thank you for your challenging presentation. Nice to see you. <laughs> uh, what would you make of the uh, observation that uh, moral futility might be a better term than medical futility? at least medical, interpreted biologically. And, and, and that uh, what you're really asking for is for us to recognize that the life of, say, Mrs. Wangley may be able to be continued biologically, but for moral reasons, it uh, is futile treatment. And if you do go with that, how far would that moral argument to go on beyond the sort of Wangley cases? It seems like that might be an easier one. You know, I've always considered medicine to be something of a moral enterprise. I think that it is possible to speak of the ends of medicine, and as one does so, one is speaking of a moral construct for the practice of medicine. The, the problem with making it, I mean, one could make it a more, say it's moral futility, and then you'd still be left with the question of whether you're going to have a first order mechanism for determining that this was immoral therapy, or whether you're going to have a second order mechanism. Now, a second order mechanism could well be a judge or an ethics committee or a jury, and that would be fine. I don't think it makes any difference. Um, whether, if you wanted to kick these off to an ethics committee as opposed to medical to a physician's judgment, I think that'd be just nifty. I don't, I don't see any problem with that. The question, though, is who's going to make the call? Because if the patient makes the call or the family makes the call, we already have a way of handling that. We can just say it's an informed refusal of therapy, OK? But here, implicit in this whole process is that the physician is making the call in advance of the, in, in distinction from the patient or family making the call. And so I, I'm inclined to call that medical futility. Um, because I think that the existing construct, for example, one could wind up in all sorts of mischief saying, well, Karen Quinlan considered the respirator futile, which is true, but I think just collapses a whole sets of language that we don't need to collapse. Yeah. Yes? What are the prospects for coming to consensus regarding the meaning of medical futility, given the irreducibly pluralistic nature of our culture? Well, I think that I think they're not uh, maybe as bad as they were a couple of years ago. Um, we have got a pluralistic society. On the other hand, we've seen 
an increasingly set of robust professional statements emerging recently. We have decisions like the Wickline decision, which suggests that you know, the resource construct is appropriate for considering some types of patient care decisions. We have an increasing recognition that we have a um, unsolvable uh, preference resource crisis in our society and that somehow it has to be solved through justice. Uh, and we also have the fact, I think, um, although I may be uh, the last to know on this, uh, one of the things that we were impressed as a hospital, aside from fairly negative comments from uh, many in the ethics, bioethics community, the public support for the hospital is actually uh, pretty decent. We had uh, supporting editorials by our two, uh, by our newspapers. Um, the media coverage uh, was uh, reasonable, uh, fairly, fairly presenting the contest. And I think one of the things that we learned somewhat to our surprise was that even despite TV's uh, tendency to frame this up as uh, Darth Vader meets Bambi, um, the hospital seemed, uh, the underlying argument was able to be perceived by the citizenry in a way that the hospital was able to survive the uh, scrutiny. So I don't, I don't know, but certainly the debate's open for discussion. I think the ethicists have got a fair amount of work to do on the difference between positive and negative rights and, and what is real autonomy and what's, bo what's a boutique shopper's privilege, but uh, they'll come around. Yeah. I'm a little confused as to whether the, uh, the upshot of this would be to say that it should be legally and morally permissible for a physician uh, to refuse to administer requested fetal treatment or whether it should be legally and morally obligated that a physician should refuse requested fetal treatment. And I wonder which one of those is more realistic or which you uh, I think that's, that's a neat question. I and I think that it actually there is a paradox in the in the Wangley case that was kind of interesting. In the course of this we were watching her valve get more her aortic valve get more and more leaky. And one of the things that always struck me in the case was that if her valve had suddenly blown and the, the aortic, the thoracic surgeon had come in and, you know, he said, well, if, you know, you can get her through surgery with a 15, 20 percent mortality. Go ahead and fix the valve. Either before or after the valve had blown, the surgeon would have said, nuts to you. I'm not going to touch this. Nobody, and the family said, we demand you do the surgery. This would not have been a public controversy. It was the respirator that was the distinction. And I think one of the, one of the issues here uh, in, um, is the question of whether or not with regard to futile claims there is a difference between withholding and withdrawing. I'm not, I'm not certain yet. Major ethicists who have said that it is wrong for us to try and withdraw the respirator have refused to answer the aortic surgery question. And uh, so I think that it's, an, it's part of the, of the theoretical work that has to be done here. Yes, sir. Would you comment on withdrawing food and fluids from um, patients who are maybe a one percent chance of getting back out of the hospital to a convalescent hospital alive? Yeah, I would be happy to comment on that. I, I've written um, in uh, the journal Theoretical Medicine that I don't think that uh, food and f I think that while we can handle refusal of food and fluids. Uh, within the theoretical construct of, of refusing life-sustaining medical treatment. I do not feel that as a society we can impose the definition of food and fluids as a medical treatment on patients and families. And so for that reason, we said that if we pulled off the respirator and hypothetically Mrs. Wangley stayed alive, we would be happy to transfer her to a long-term care center to continue to receive food and fluids. I believe that there are transactional, is a transactional dimension of food and fluids which distinguishes it uh, from ventilators and which is a claim which should be honored. And so I personally would not go so far as to claim that a unilateral decision to withhold food and fluids could, could or should be made. And perform a gastrostomy? Um, if, if, the, if the patient or family requests food and fluids, I honor that request. Um, but, you know, consistency is a hobgoblin of little minds. I'm kind of, you know, no, I, I mean, I, I just, I'm not willing, I don't think that our society 
uh, given the nature of the feeding relationship, which is a transaction, I think that to, to bring food and fluids into this is uh, both unnecessary and, and may not be conceptually sound. Um, on the other hand, I think that a full-blown ICU treatment, as Mrs. Wangley was receiving, clearly fits within the entire framework of medical treatment. There's the, the transactional aspects of that in terms of the interpersonal caring aspects and so forth, as compared to feeding, I think can be very sharply distinguished from, from a phenomenon side, and so I don't have any problem with that. But I, I think that the point you're making is an important one. I, I concede the ambiguity in the choice. I saw two more, three more hands, but I think we should terminate the formal part of this presentation. Thank Dr. Miles very much, and invite those of you with further questions to come down front and uh, talk one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you so much.